Special edition of PFTOT occasioned by the unexpected news as it relates to the Miami Dolphins and owner Stephen Ross. It wasn't that long ago that I asked the league, when are we going to hear something about the independent investigation by Mary Jo White that had been going on for some period of time as to the allegation that at some point in the 2019 season, Ross had offered former coach Brian Flores $100,000 per loss. Well, today, just one day after the decision was issued by Judge Sue L. Robinson in the Deshaun Watson case, and while the NFL is in the three-day window for deciding whether to appeal, and I don't think it was a coincidence. This is a great opportunity for the NFL to show the world that they hold owners to a high standard as well as players. Higher standard, who knows? But this was a great opportunity to whack an owner at a time when they may be exercising their right to appeal the Judge Robinson decision to the NFL itself for potentially more than a six-game suspension. So I don't think there are any coincidences, excuse me, easy for him to say, when it comes to things like this. Definitely no coincidence today. So let's begin. Stephen Ross found guilty of something we didn't even know he was being investigated for, but we knew that tampering had happened. Here's the thing with tampering in the NFL. Happens all the time. Only sporadically and almost randomly does someone get caught. Now, usually there's no rhyme or reason for it. In this case, I believe that finding Stephen Ross guilty of tampering and taking away a 2024 first-round pick and a 2023 third-round pick from the team and finding Ross $1.5 million, I think that was a way to punish him for something because they couldn't punish him for tanking. I'll get to that momentarily. As it relates to tampering, they had him dead to rights, and everybody knew. I had just finished a spot with Dan Levitard where he brought up this Bizarre question of why the effort by the Dolphins to get Sean Payton and Tom Brady hadn't been the biggest story of the offseason. It was ridiculous why it wasn't a bigger story. And here it was. It was true. They tried. Now, I'm told it was a done deal, but for the Brian Flores lawsuit, it was happening. Brady was going to be introduced as a minority owner of the Dolphins. Brady was potentially going to take a front office job. Ben Volan of the Boston Globe added that piece to it. Brady was eventually going to return to action as a player on the Dolphins, and along the way, Sean Payton was going to become the head coach in a trade with the Saints. What we learned today was that Ross was caught with his hand in the cookie jar as it relates to Brady. And it didn't just start this year. I remember reporting and explaining on more than one occasion when Tom Brady became a free agent in 2020. In the run-up to that, the Patriots were very fearful that he was going to land with the Dolphins. And Bruce Beal has always been the magnet for Brady to Miami. Beal and Brady are close friends. Beal's significant other is close with Tom Brady's wife. It's always been kind of, not always, for as long as they've become friends, it's been a very close relationship, which has caused people to believe eventually Brady's going to be a member of the Dolphins, either in the ownership group or as a player. So the tampering finding... Item number one, the Dolphins had impermissible communications with quarterback Tom Brady in 2019 and 2020 while he was under contract to the New England Patriots. Those communications began as early as August 2019 and continued through the 2019 season and postseason. These numerous and detailed discussions were conducted by Mr. Beal, who in turn kept Mr. Ross and other Dolphins executives informed of his discussions with Mr. Brady. So that's how it started. But it continued. Item two, the Dolphins again had impermissible communications with Brady and his agent during and after the 2021 season while he was under contract to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Those discussions began no later than early December 2021 and focused on Mr. Brady becoming a limited partner in the Dolphins and possibly serving as a football executive, although at times they also included the possibility of him playing for the Dolphins. Both Ross and Beal were active participants in these discussions. It began no later than early December 2021. While Brady is trying to help the Buccaneers back to the postseason for another Super Bowl run, he's already planning his retirement, not from football, but from the Buccaneers. And remember, I said that time and again, and it took a lot of flack for it, but it was true. He retired from the Buccaneers. And the thinking was he was going to land with the Dolphins. 
And bottom line, as far as NFL is concerned, they were talking to him about it in violation of the tampering rules, and he was allowing himself to be tampered with. Now, technically, he's done nothing wrong, but it's a horrible look for a guy who's playing for the Buccaneers to be talking to the Dolphins about joining the Dolphins after the season in which Brady is still playing for the Buccaneers. Now, of course, it's Tom Brady, so he won't get nearly the criticism he deserves for this, but he should. Oh, yes, he should. In January 2022, the Dolphins had impermissible communications with Don Yee, the agent for Saints head coach Sean Payton, also represents Brady. Brady, excuse me. They had conversations with Yee about Payton serving as the Miami head coach. Miami did not seek consent from the Saints to have these discussions, which occurred before Coach Payton announced his decision to retire as coach of the Saints. Following that announcement, Miami requested permission to speak to Coach Payton for the first time, which New Orleans declined to grant. Now, we had already explained that. We had reported on that, that Chris Greer said no when Jeff Ireland, the former Dolphins GM and assistant GM with the Saints, called Greer. However, the discussions were happening at a higher level. And this was all done. They can whack Ross for tampering, but the reality is, after the tampering, the wheels were in motion. The pieces were in place for the Dolphins to get Peyton and to eventually get Brady. It got derailed by the Flores lawsuit. And there's still people who are like, oh, well, you reported that it was a done deal, and this is just that there was tampering. Oh, come on, come on, come on, people. Do you really think that we're only partially right on this when we'd been doubted for so long, when we'd been accused of making it up? As I've said time and again, if I'm going to make stuff up, it's going to be a lot more interesting than this, although this was pretty interesting. So we were right. And no one else is going to say it, although some are today, and I appreciate that. But we're going to say it. We were right about this, and it's amazing it wasn't a bigger story. And one of the reasons it wasn't a bigger story is because ESPN and NFL Network were asleep at the switch. Now, Shefty may have known about it and decided to hold it for the right time, like he did remember the thing about Aaron Rodgers wanting out of Green Bay. He held it for the right moment. He may have been waiting for the right moment to break it. He may have known about it, but they never reported it. It didn't create three days of the snake eating its own tail on ESPN with studio shows and sports center and talking, talking and under the the, the bottom of the screen. It it, it never happened. So it didn't become a big story. And NFL Network was asleep at the switch as well. So it never became a big deal. And I thought what would happen is we'd get the report week one of the 2022 season. But thanks to Mary Jo White's investigation and the fact that the league had to suspend Ross for something. They find him guilty of tampering. Here's what the commissioner had to say. The investigators found tampering violations of unprecedented scope and severity. I know of no prior instance of a team violating the prohibition of tampering with both a head coach and a star player to the potential detriment of multiple other clubs over a period of several years. Similarly, I've known of no prior instance in which ownership was so directly involved in the violations. Good. Fine. You're right. Why the hell is it only a one and a half million dollar fine and one first round pick and a third round pick? and a suspension for six weeks of the season. This is unprecedented. Why isn't Ross suspended for the whole year? Why, 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 why isn't this treated like the affront to the overall integrity of the game that it is? Now, part of it is they know that this happens. See, this is what's going to be interesting going forward. What are they going to do when this stuff happens in the future? Is everybody just going to be scared straight for a year or two, and then it's going to start happening again? Because it happens. And the guy who loses big on this <laughs> is Sean Payton. Sean Payton may not get back into the NFL in 2023 because everyone's going to be afraid to talk to him. And there's going to be no tampering. Not with Don Yee. Don, Don Yee, regardless of how you feel about it, it looks like Don Yee fessed up to the NFL when the NFL has no jurisdiction over him. That he admitted exactly what was going on. Sounds like he talked. Who's going to talk to Don Yee? Who's going to trust Don Yee if there's any attempt to tamper, to try to line up Sean Payton to be a team's head coach? Because here's how we thought it was going to go. A team, before it fires its own head coach, is going to try to figure out if it can get Payton. Once it knows it can get Payton, then it activates the effort to move on from its current coach, just like Jerry Jones was going to do three years ago when he was going to fire Jason Garrett and hire Sean Payton. So that's a little twist to this that we'll probably discuss more on PFT Live on Wednesday. 
Peyton's effort to get back in the NFL may have been complicated by this outcome of tampering. So that's the tampering side of it. Now comes the tanking side of it. And the headline is basically Ross was exonerated. But was he really exonerated? Let's look at what actually was found. Now, this is what the NFL led with as the first item because this is important to the NFL to have this out there, to have no one think that there was any effort to lose games. Item one, the Dolphins did not intentionally lose games during the 2019 season, nor did anyone at the club, including Mr. Ross, instruct Coach Flores to do so. No witness contended otherwise. The Dolphins competed hard to win every game, including at the end of the season when they beat Cincinnati and New England, despite worsening Miami's position in the 2020 draft. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. But item two, on a number of occasions during the 2019 season, Mr. Ross expressed his belief that the Dolphins' position in the upcoming 2020 draft should take priority over the team's win-loss record. These comments were made most frequently to team president and CEO Tom Garfinkel, but were also made to general manager Chris Greer, senior VP Brandon Shore, and Coach Flores. These comments, which Coach Flores took to be suggestions that he lose games, troubled Coach Flores and led him to express his concerns in writing to senior club executives, each of whom assured Coach Flores that everyone, including Mr. Ross, supported him in building a winning culture in Miami. After this, Mr. Ross made no such comments to Coach Flores. Now, look, here's, here's the reality. And as it relates to the offer of $100,000 to lose games, the league found differing recollections about the wording, the timing, and the context. However, phrased, such a comment was not intended to be taken as a serious offer, nor was the subject pursued in any respect by Mr. Ross or anyone else at the club. Yeah, because Flores said no. If Flores had said yes, it would have been different. See, Flores saved Ross's ass here. Ross continues to be the owner of the Dolphins because Flores did the right thing, and he was commended by the commissioner for doing the right thing. But Flores also signed his own pink slip by doing the right thing because that was the moment that Ross realized, I can't trust this guy because he's not doing what I want to do, and I'm the owner of the team. I'm the guy with the big yacht. I'm the guy with the billions of dollars. I'm the guy that gets what I want, and I want better draft position next year. I want Joe Burrow. So... I don't know how they didn't find a violation here. At a minimum, it's attempted tanking. If you shoot a gun at somebody, meaning to kill them, and you miss, you're not innocent. You're guilty of attempted murder. Stephen Ross is guilty of attempted tanking. But the NFL, they had to give him a pass on this for two reasons. One, finding him guilty of this would have made Brian Flores' lawsuit stronger, much stronger. Because Brian Flores claims one of the reasons he was fired is Ross soured on him because Flores refused to go along with the tanking. But also, in an era of legalized gambling, oh boy, if you admit, if you acknowledge, if you punish a team for trying to lose games directly or indirectly, either specific games or big picture, hey, we just got to take our lumps and we're going to end up with a better draft position— it goes to the integrity of the game. It goes to the integrity of gambling on the games. And you got to worry about Congress. you got to worry about the creation of an agency that will be up your butt all the time. And you got to worry about prosecution. That's why the league found no violation here. The league twisted itself into a pretzel to find no violation. There was a violation. And Stephen Ross should have been punished for it. And his statement is laughable. We have the statement. I think it's going to come up on the screen here in a second, and we can take a look at what he said. The independent investigation cleared our organization on any issues relating to tanking and all of Brian Flores' other allegations. Now, that part's just false because Flores alleged that he was pressured to tamper with a high-profile quarterback, which was Tom Brady. So that allegation was validated by this tampering investigation. As I've said all along, Ross added these allegations were false, malicious, and defamatory, and this issue is now put to rest. With regards to tampering, I strongly disagree with the conclusions and the punishment. However, I will accept the outcome because the most important thing is that there will be no distractions for our team as we begin an exciting and winning season. I will not allow anything to get in the way of that. Well, here's one thing that got in the way of it. He's going forward with plan B as his head coach and quarterback. He wanted Peyton and Brady. He's got Mike McDaniel and Tua Tonga Bailoa. That's already a distraction. We now know that these weren't the best options that Stephen Ross wanted. He wanted better. 
He tried to get better, and it blew up in his face. And it all fell apart when Flores filed his lawsuit. So Flores is the hero here in a variety of ways. Without Flores, it never comes to light. But without Flores doing the right thing, now, now see, that's the problem. Because Flores resisted, Flores saved Ross from possibly losing his team. However, we don't know about any of it unless Flores blows the whistle. And it makes you wonder how many occasions there have been where the coach just goes along to get along, to stay in the good graces. Lovey Smith with the Bucks. Sorry, it's true. He may get mad about it. 2014, they take out half the starters going into the second half of a game against the Saints. Sean Payton was on set with us at the Super Bowl talking about how he's, you know, he usually gets information from people up in the booth saying, you know, so and so is out and someone else is in, so and so and out. So it's like everybody was out. All new guys are coming in. He's like, what the hell's going on here? They wanted to get the first pick in the 2015 draft. So they tanked. And Stephen, not Stephen Ross, but Lovey Smith went along with it. In this case, Flores didn't go along with it. And if he had, it would have been worse. And Flores blew the whistle on it. And he wouldn't have blown the whistle on it if he had gone along with it. That's why I think they should have found some something. It's bad enough that Ross was talking about it. I mean, come on. When you are a multi-billionaire owner of an NFL team and you're merely talking about it, what are you doing? You're giving instructions. Who will rid me of this meddlesome priest? Hi, Miles. That's what you're doing. One of the privileges of being that rich is you never have to give a direct order. The people who work for you and who value the ability to continue to work for you will get the message without being given an express instruction. Brian Flores also issued a statement. We posted it at PFT. Let's see if I can find it here. He's disappointed that the investigation minimized Stephen Ross's comments, and there's good reason for that. He should be. Because he tried to tank. It was attempted tanking. I am thankful that the NFL's investigator found my allegations against Stephen Ross are true, Flores said. At the same time, I'm disappointed to learn the investigator minimized Mr. Ross's offers and pressure to tank games, especially when I wrote and submitted a letter at the time to Dolphins executives documenting my serious concerns regarding this subject at the time, which the investigator has in her possession. While the investigator found that the Dolphins had engaged in impermissible tankering, uh, tampering, of unprecedented scope and severity, Mr. Ross will avoid any meaningful consequence. There is nothing more important when it comes to the game of football itself than the integrity of the game. When the integrity of the game is called into question, fans suffer and football suffers and gamblers suffer. They had no choice. They got him on tampering because they had to get him on something. They weren't going to get him on tanking because that would have created a mess for everyone. And I think once they realized the ramifications, because at first... My understanding was, look, this is it for Ross. This is it. This is real. He's done. I think he was saved by the fact that it's going to hurt a lot more people than just him if they had found that he had done what Brian Flores accused him of doing. And remember this, the litigation goes forward, the Flores litigation. He'll tell his story. It's still an issue. It's not over just because the NFL has decided to find no violation, even though it should have found a violation. All right, here's what I'm going to do because I need to shut up and move on. I still got to go. I still got to drive to Canton today. I have first world problem getting in a car and sitting there for three hours. I know. All right. I asked for some questions on the PFT Twitter page specifically related to this issue. I'm going to scroll through here and see if uh, if there's anything else that stands out. How should Tua feel today? That's a question from Neil Watch's PFT. There is now a report that Ross has been actively trying to get Brady for three years prior to and during Tua's tenure as the Dolphins' starting quarterback. Yeah, and you throw in the effort to get Deshaun Watson last year. Tua has been unwanted by Stephen Ross. Tua was the guy that we initially heard the tank for Tua mantra for before he broke his hip in the 2019 college football season. That's when Stephen Ross pivoted to Joe Burrow, and Tua ended up being the guy that was left at number five, and they should have just taken Justin Herbert at number five instead of number six. Neil Watch's PFT also says that the tampering policy indicates that there should be compensation for the offended teams should the Patriots, Saints, and Buccaneers get any recompense. That's a good question. I mean, it looks like it's over. It looks like nothing's going to happen there. But you do have three victims of the tampering. The Saints, the Patriots, and the Buccaneers. And maybe one of the reasons that Sean Payton 
quit his job with the Saints if he thought he was going to land with the Dolphins. Maybe if he knew he wasn't going to get that Dolphins job, he would have stayed in New Orleans for another year. We don't know the answer to that question, but it's entirely possible the Saints lost their head coach this year because he thought he was going to resign and then resurface as coach of the Dolphins. Tom Marshall, should Tom Brady be criticized for allowing himself to be tampered with? It doesn't look good on him that talks got so far. And I said that earlier. I think that he should be criticized, and hopefully he will be criticized. And hopefully he'll be asked some tough questions by Buccaneers reporters that do a lot of fawning of Tommy. Not all of them. Not all of them. But there's a certain amount of tiptoeing around Tommy that happens. He needs to be asked some tough questions because as the league has found it, he was talking to the Dolphins about playing for them during the 2021 season when he was playing for the Buccaneers. If I'm a Buccaneers fan, I'm pissed off, and I want to hear exactly what was going on, even though, as we know, and Tom Brady has said of it himself, 90% of the time, what he says isn't how he actually feels. Terry Gensler, how much fun do you have reading the comments on your post about this story from February? Maybe I should go back and look at those and retweet some of those, but that, that would be petty. I'm not. I'm not petty. I'm not. Uh, Nathan Jacobson, if Tua isn't the guy this year, their hunt for a franchise quarterback in the draft next year got a lot harder. Do you think this will put off Tom Brady and Sean Payton from ever joining the franchise? Well, I still think Brady, or I thought Brady was in play for next year, but now it may be that if he decides to keep playing in 2023, he just doesn't even consider the Dolphins. But now that we already know that he talked to them, I don't know how much more damage can be done. It's not like if he joins the Dolphins, people are going to say, aha, we knew you talked to the Dolphins. We already know. So I think he can still play for the Dolphins. You know, six months from now is basically six years from now. A lot's going to happen between now and the end of the football season. I don't think it closes the door. Uh, Rob Taglia points out it's weird to write off Ross's comments as not serious and in the same breath commend Flores for not letting them affect his effort to win. That, that, that's the problem here, and that gets back to what I was saying. Flores was the hero. He saved Ross, and he blew the whistle on what Ross was doing. It just feels like there should be something more for Ross because if you truly want to deter this kind of behavior— when you catch someone in the act and you have a coach who is willing to do the right thing by refusing to go along with it and then by standing up and being counted, that's something that needs to have full and complete punishment of the owner because there are probably plenty of other cases where the coach, as I said earlier, just goes along. All right, let's see what else we have here. We have probably cover... Covered most of uh, everything that we can. Here we go. Football God. Was this strategically announced now to be glossed over by the Watson news? I, I don't think it's to be glossed over by Watson. I think it's to be subsumed within Watson so that we see the NFL punishing an owner at the same time the NFL is deciding whether to reject a six-game suspension of Deshaun Watson and seek more from the NFL itself. I think this is a great way for us to be able to say, see, they punish owners too. That's what I think this is. And it, it doesn't change my feeling that the NFL is going to appeal Judge Robinson's decision to the NFL and that the NFL is going to impose a higher suspension. Uh, let's see what else we have here. And we appreciate any of the tweets where folks are acknowledging that we were right all along. That It, it does look at, I mean, it, it, if you're human... When you have a moment like that, it does feel kind of good to be right when you were doubted by people who had no idea what was really going on and they just doubted it because they're Buccaneers fans and they don't want to hear that their quarterback didn't want to play for their team anymore, that it truly was some decision he made to simply come back and play for the Buccaneers, not that his other door was closed. He just chose to come back to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. All right. Um, hey, this is William Buckskin. Do, you, do they expect us to actually believe their conclusion about tanking considering the rest of the report it seems like a blatant cover for the owners and it definitely does and I think that's the thing that needs to resonate from this he tried to tank he engaged in attempted tanking and but for Brian, Brian Flores he would have engaged in actual tanking and but for Brian Flores we wouldn't know about attempted or actual 
tanking. All right. Um, let me do one more, and then let's wrap it up. Well, two more. Picks 204. From playmakers, we know head coaching hires are a done deal before the old coach is fired. With them explicitly punishing that behavior in this case, do you think the process will improve and fix some issues that the Rooney Rule had failed to, or will owners just get more shady and secretive with head coaching hiring? And look, this in a roundabout way, it makes Brian Flores' lawsuit stronger as it relates to the race discrimination issue because the tampering doesn't just violate the tampering rule. It violates the Rooney Rule. They went out and lined up a white head coach at a time when they possibly hadn't even engaged in a proper or any search. It, it just it undermines everything the league is trying to do to ensure diversity when it comes to head coaching searches and inclusiveness when it comes to looking for a coach, not picking a guy and secretly getting the deal done and then putting everything into motion. So I think what's going to happen is there's a league meeting next week for the purposes of uh, approving the purchase of the Broncos by Rob Walton and Greg Penner. They may want to they may, they may think twice after this, but um, someone told me that there's an expectation that the league office and specifically the commissioner is going to read the riot act to the owners next week. And the question then is how long does this last? Is it really going to change the way things are done? I think it will for a short period of time, but there's too much tampering to make it all go away. They can't police it in every instance there will be occasions where it falls through the cracks. And sometimes like this, it becomes kind of a compromise punishment. When you can't punish him for tanking, you got him for something else. One more. Beats and hops. Why is there no punishment for tampering for Brady and Peyton? They were active participants in this. The tampering rules don't apply to them. They're allowed to be tampered with. It's a bad look. And as I said earlier, it may make Sean Peyton radioactive for 2023. But... There's no violation in being the one who is tampered with. They should possibly consider expanding the tampering policy to make it a violation, not just to be the tamperer, but to be the tamperee, to be the one who willingly goes along with it and doesn't report it and engages in the communications in an effort to try to facilitate the tampering. It would require negotiation with the NFL Players Association to make players responsible for tampering, but there is no union for the coaches. You can just make it part of the policy unilaterally without notice. Here we go. And it does make me wonder, and there was already a concern whether or not someone at the league office wouldn't want Sean Payton back in after the bounty scandal. This may make it harder for him to ever get back in. We'll see. That's it for now. We'll see you tomorrow morning from Canton, Ohio site of the Hall of Fame game, PFT Live. Chris Sims and I will revisit these issues from today, maybe talk about them in a little more structured way instead of just sitting down and going for about a half hour or so. But we wanted to create some content that you can absorb today. We'll be talking about it. We'll be writing about it. And we thank you for your time and your attention. And thanks again to those of you who acknowledge that once in a while, the blind squirrel is chewing on an acorn. I'm going to go back down to my office and eat some acorn for the rest of the day. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.